Seems like we're getting a pretty decent uh, group building in the participant list, so maybe we can get started. I'll start with uh, introductions. So thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here for the ISPD NAC Eastern Time Zone Journal Club. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Shraddha Raghavan. She is a second year renal fellow at Brown, who will be talking to us about catheters and uh, prior abdominal surgeries, as well as catheters and adhesions. Uh, just a reminder, next month we will be back October 21st at noon Eastern time, and we are recording, and we have a uh, extra special presentation today because we have multiple authors and senior PIs in the house uh, with Rob Quinn and Matt Oliver, who are leaders of the uh, catheter consortium. So it's great to have them here and uh, excited to hear your thoughts, Shraddha, and your perspectives in leading this project, Rob and Matt. Hi, everyone. I'm Shraddha, one of the second year fellows here. Like Dr. Shah said, we're going to be talking about outcomes of peritoneal dialysis catheters and their association with a prior history of abdominal surgeries. So today we'll be mostly discussing the results and discussion from these two papers. The first one is titled Impact of Prior Abdominal Procedures on Peritoneal Dialysis Catheter Outcomes. And the other one is called The Association of Intra-Abdominal Adhesions with PD Catheter-Related Complications. Like Dr. Shah just said, both papers are written by a familiar group of names and faces that we all recognize. And they were really both a treat for me to read and present this afternoon. So just to get started on some background information on this topic, it's been documented by various papers in the field that complications from PD catheters occur in about 25% of patients and usually also occur within the first six months or so from insertion of the catheter. But factors that influence outcomes is not clearly understood. PD catheters are traditionally placed by surgeons either via an open or laparoscopic approach, which allows for direct visualization of certain structures like adhesions. And now oftentimes it's also placed percutaneously by either a trained interventional radiologist or nephrologist. But this visualization is important to verify whether the adhesions may hinder with catheter placement and subsequently with their function as well. Adhesions from abdominal surgeries may cause catheter obstruction, which is a known risk factor for poor catheter outcomes and other related complications. And sometimes the process of adhesiolysis is performed in many cases prior to catheter placement to improve some of these outcomes, but its effect is not so quite understood on the overall risk reduction. Prior reports show that about 54% of patients when abdominal surgeries may have adhesions, but the effect on catheter obstruction or a need for revision, the overall survival of the catheter by performing this um, adhesiolysis beforehand has not really been shown, at least in the various single center studies that were done in the past. Due to possible concern of catheter-related complications, the decision to refer to PD as a modality of renal replacement therapy, and also the method of PD catheter insertion may end up depending on the patient's history of abdominal surgery. And also in some institutions, PD might not even be offered to those patients for this reason, which authors of this paper and many others like it are considerably weary about. Both papers that we discussed today are multi-center studies that aim to delineate the effect of abdominal surgery the presence of adhesions, and then complications related to obstruction and the need for surgical revision. So let's dive into each one individually. We'll start with the paper titled Dissociation of Intra-Abdominal Adhesions by PD Catheter-Related Complications. It's by Dr. Qureshi and, and many of his colleagues. And really the aim here is to describe factors that are associated with the presence of intra-abdominal adhesions association of adhesions with PD catheter-related complications, and then lastly, abnormalities that were found at the time of PD catheter rev revision procedures. This study was based in 11 centers across US and Canada, and the groups were divided based on the presence of adhesions at the time of catheter placement or without the presence of adhesions. The study population was defined in figure one of, of their paper, the inclusion criteria included the laparoscopic 
approach or technique to catheter insertion. Um, and they had started with about 1,300 patients or so and excluded those that were not done laparoscopically or had less than six months of follow-up. And then also adult patients only were included. This left about 760 patients, 200 of which had adhesions, then about 560 did not have adhesions. The catheters that were followed for or had a survival of less than six months were also included in the study because why they failed and whether they had to do with the catheter placement and this risk factor would be relevant to the, the overall conclusions or outcomes of the paper. This is the list of baseline characteristics that they included. They included age, the gender of the patient, the BMI, a few of the core morbidities like diabetes, heart disease, other vascular disease, and whether they had a history of hernias, malignancy, and any prior surgeries, both the type of surgery and also the location of the surgery. So in terms of their outcomes, their primary outcome for this first study was either the composite of never starting PD, termination of PD once it was initiated, or the need for some sort of invasive procedure like a catheter revision or replacement, which was due to either abdominal pain or flow restriction through the catheter, which are common complaints for patients that, that you know, allow us to do a further workup. And then the secondary outcomes included either migration of the catheter tip, occlusion of the lumen, of course, new adhesions that might have formed after the insertion of the PD catheter, and then also parts of the abdomen like bowel or omentum that might have been wrapped. These outcomes had more to do with abnormalities related to the catheter, but I think they're pretty good surrogates for why patients have either interrupted treatment or discontinuation of their PD. So moving on to their statistical analyses, I mostly summarized here um, what the, the study had done. So the risk factors for adhesion were estimated by logistical models. The chi-square tests were used to compare the relationship between the location of the surgery, adhesions, whether a TC lysis was performed. So, you know, baseline characteristics. And um, the primary outcomes were expressed as cumulative incidence curves for the first year to represent the risk. And of course, they had accounted for competing risks like death, transplant, if the patient had renal recovery and came off of PD treatment, or PD was never started or was getting terminated. The proportional hazard ratio models were also reported in unadjusted and adjusted hazard ratios. So we knew whether the presence of adhesions or um, the absence of adhesions were related to the primary outcome. And then lastly, the covariates were adjusted for, and those covariables included age, sex, BMI, the presence of adhesions, and whether that initial procedure was performed or not. This is one of the first papers that saw patients at this magnitude and also looked at various of these covariables at the same time. So table one here is a summary of their baseline characteristics, and they were mostly equal between the two groups, the two groups being the adhesion group and the no adhesion group, except really for gender, which was 54% female for the adhesions group and only 33% for the non-adhesions group. And also the BMI was slightly higher in the adhesions group. But the types of surgeries were pretty varied between the two groups, likely more to do with the pathophysiology of that specific disease for which the surgery was performed, however, could have huge influences on our outcomes. And lastly, you know, there's a list of various catheter types and surgical techniques, which were more or less balanced between the groups. So here is table two. It really shows the association of prior surgery and the type of surgery. The type of surgery was actually represented in one of their supplemental tables on the risks that patients had with adhesions. So based on these results, there was a significant association between prior abdominal surgery and the presence of adhesions. This is important to note because abdominal surgery in both studies that we're going to look at today is being used as a surrogate for the development of adhesions and ultimately on the outcomes. The outcomes were based on whether patients had adhesions, which is 
you know, a true risk exposure or not um, in, in trying to understand these outcomes. So what they found was about 230 of these individuals, that's about 30% of their cohort, 55% of them had adhesions compared to only 14% who did not have a prior surgery had those adhesions. The adjusted odds ratio for adhesions with any surgery compared with no surgery was 8.3, that's here, which was significant. The odds ratio in the second half of this chart shows that adhesions were not higher when there were a greater number of surgeries performed. So if a patient had two, three, or more surgeries in their lifetime, those confidence intervals do not cross one, so they're not significant. Surgeries that most frequently had adhesions were the cholecystectomies, prior C-sections, prior PD catheter placements, and kidney transplant. And though not shown in, in this table, the supplemental table one also reports that the presence of adhesions did vary among according to the type and the location of the surgery. For example, the adhesion group did have more often adhesions in the lower abdomen, for example. So here are the conclusions of figure two. They were quite in support of the fact that adhesions are associated with PD catheter complications. These PD-associated complications required an invasive procedure or it led to PD never starting or getting terminated as per the data collected in other parts of this, of this study. The x-axis here shows two types of data. It shows time over the first year after the PD catheter was inserted, and also it has the number of patients in the adhesions and no adhesions group remaining after taking out those that were lost to complications like we just discussed. And then the y-axis is the cumulative risk of these complications. And we can see the two groups for adhesions and non-adhesions look like they diverge over time with the risk of complications being greater and close to doubling in the first year for the adhesions group. It was about 10% for the non-adhesion group and 17% for the adhesion group where the unadjusted hazard ratio confidence interval was between about one and two and a half that doesn't cr cross one, so it is significant. But plainly put, I would say the study found that there is a, a difference in cumulative incidence of catheter complications between the two groups. That brings us to the close of um, the first study. Some of the biggest takeaways that I found important were that most patients with or without adhesions did not experience complications, and most patients required revision procedures, not termination of PD. This study found that the prevalence of prior abdominal surgery in patients undergoing PD was about 30%, which is consistent to prior reports in the literature describing that prevalence rate to be between 30 and 60%. And also consistent with prior reports, the study found that being female and undergoing a gynecological surgery had the highest risk of complications, but other risk factors maybe previously thought to have a greater influence may not. However, this, this study found that contrary to prior reports, that the greater number of surgeries performed over the patient's lifetime weren't necessarily associated with higher risk of complications. The difference in the data reported is likely a reflection of adjusted risks that were reported with and without the TCOLysis. And an important application of the results of the study is that patients should not be excluded from having PD catheter inserted if they have had multiple prior surgeries. And most importantly, patients should be informed of these risks, but should most likely be continued to be offered PD as an option for renal replacement modality. Prior studies had mixed Results on whether a DCLysis improved outcomes of the PD catheter survival. Some even showed like a higher risk of mechanical catheter obstruction, but thus studies showed that there was like a modestly lower risk of complications with a DCLysis being performed. And more likely we need, you know, continued studies to really analyze and ascertain the role of that procedure in preventing complications related to PD. And then lastly, we'll discuss some of the limitations of this paper as well. The study only reported data on patients who had underwent laparoscopic PD catheter insertion as they could all be assessed adequately for adhesions visually, not any other surgical approach to catheter insertion. So I guess that's not truly representative of all of the patients that we may encounter and 
in um, one to start on PD. And then similarly, there was no information on patients excluded from PD due to prior surgery that were low risk surgical patients or without prior abdominal surgery who might have been directly referred for like percutaneous PD catheter insertion. And then despite being the largest study thus far analyzing adhesions, other complications like infection related or subgroup analyses between complications were also not included. So maybe we'll take a moment to reflect on the first paper and chat about that before we get into the second one. Uh, I think the first thing I would say in reflecting on this is that while there was an increased rate of adhesions in those with prior abdominal surgeries and an increased rate of complications in those with adhesions, the vast majority of patients in the study, regardless of adhesions or prior abdominal surgeries, had no complications. And the second thing that I would say is that even those who did, it didn't largely lead to termination of PD. It led to procedures, but the patients remained on PD. So I think that I would say as my takeaway that I thought it was really I'm glad that this was kind of pursued as two different papers. You don't know if your patient has adhesions until you're in the operating room and you're looking at them. So I really appreciated the perspective of Matt and Rob breaking apart prior abdominal surgeries and adhesions because you get the information at different points. But I think an important takeaway is that adhesions may give you a bumpier road, but you will largely end up at the same outcome. And even though they may give you a bumpier road, the vast majority of patients will not have a bumpy road. Uh, Matt and Rob, I would love your perspectives. Um, yeah, I make a couple comments. I mean, if you read the prior literature, it really doesn't suggest that like prior surgery is a big deal, adhesions are a big deal, and adhesiolysis takes care of them. That's kind of the read of it. But I think this gives a bit of a more clear view of it that adhesions um, are significant and they will increase risk of complications. And as noted, mostly procedures, not terminations. Um, although to be fair, I, we did time to first event, so it might be that they had a procedure and then they went on to be terminated, but I don't, we don't think we analyzed it for this paper. So, so this gives sort of, I think a more balanced view of it. The other thing that we didn't do, which could be future work is we didn't really classify the adhesions that we, we didn't get the surgeons to classify the adhesions at the time of the surgery. Like, where are they? How extensive are they? How significant are they? And that and, and those kind of details of the in terms of judgment of who when they did adhesive lysis, you know, presumably if they did them for more like pelvic adhesions, all that kind of detail would have been nice to pull out at the time. Um, getting surgeons to answer questions is not an easy endeavor, I can tell you that. So I'm not sure that is feasible, but we did have to sort of rely on the operative reports. And in many cases, we didn't get severity um, and we didn't get, uh, you know, whether they did or did not do an adhesion because they thought it was significant. Um, I can also say that, you know, the surgeons going in and finding the adhesions that were so extensive that they could not place a catheter was a very, very rare event. <laughs> yeah, and I guess I think, the only other point yeah. that I'd make, Anchor, is that, you know, to your point earlier, you know, when you kind of look at the the life cycle of PD catheter insertion, our first contact with people, you know, often we're asking about prior abdominal surgery and this type of information is not available to us until we get into the OR and, and then only in laparoscopic placement. You know, I, I think it is the one other kind of important takeaway is that this information, so when somebody goes for catheter insertion, they note adhesions at the time of the catheter insertion. It's actually helpful prognostically and may, you know, identify a patient who's higher risk of having complications and somebody might want to watch closely for those types of things. Um, so that's that's kind of the other point to make. Building off of that, I have a question for the group here. Um, do people still um, do flushes after catheter surgery or what are the opportunities, what are the interventions that could be used um, postoperatively? Suppose somebody does have a lot of adhesions, you do a lot of adhesiolysis and then what, what do you dif do differently after monitoring? Uh some of our expert surgeons, like Dr. Crabtree, have suggested if they do extensive desiolysis, they should have more frequent uh, flushing and to get sort of the blood or fibrin out. That's been talked about, but I haven't seen, I'm not aware of any studies regarding that. And I'm not sure if any PD units are specifically doing more flushing if they feel the procedure is more extensive. 
I can say our personal experience is that we are not, we are doing our standard weekly flushing kind of regardless of the intraoperative findings. Uh, anyone else in the audience with thoughts? And Osama, you've got your hand raised. Yeah, no, we do the weekly flushes the same way that they do at, at uh, your location, Anchor. Don't really um, adjust, uh, adjust for that. Uh, but the thought that I had too on this is that you know, it's helpful to build expectations, right? So rather than, you know, kind of, you know, what Rob said, you know, you're kind of going to find out when the surgeon goes in or, you know, we're going to figure out uh, what it is. We have on average, listen, this is what you're going to expect. There is a high chance given the fact that you had the surgery uh, right in the past that, uh, you know, th that you might need an intervention, um, and then they tell you, Hey, listen, I had three surgeries on, on my belly in the past. Does it matter? Right. And we can say, well, you know, we can't be hundred percent sure, but in your case, uh, sorry, but, uh, but overall the study that was done showed that there is no difference. Uh, right. It's kind of like when patients get uh, AV fistulas placed, right. We let them know, right. There's about a 50% chance that you're going to need a revision, right. Some of, sometimes it may not even mature, and we don't really tend to share or know too much about that information when it comes to PD catheters, right? So I think it kind of helps guide the conversation and helps us counsel our patients better. Great points. Rob and Tom, you both have thoughts. Uh, we can go to Rob first. Yeah. So, you know, the one thing I came across in, in doing the, some of the background reading for these papers was that there's a whole surgical literature on the use of icodextrin to prevent adhesions. Um, and that's not something that, that, to my knowledge, we've talked a lot about in the PD world. Um, and that may be another opportunity to intervene, um, you know, the potential role of using icodextrin preferentially in patients that are maybe at higher risk of complications, because there is some literature to suggest it makes a difference. That's actually exactly what I was going to comment on. In fact, in the gynecologic surgery world, the 4% Icodextrin Solutions brand name is Adhesion Reduction Solution. Uh, and so I'm very interested. I, I think I actually reached out to you about if that was something we could look into in the catheter registry. I don't think we had that data. I will admit it's not something that I'm aggressively going to Icodextrin earlier in patients with adhesions, although that doesn't mean I shouldn't be. Uh, Tom, your thoughts. Uh, first of all, do you mind sending that paper out, the one you just cited, uh, Anker? That, that's a very interesting paper. And I want to comment on the physiology of that, but I want to come back to my original question. It has been known for a long time, and, and a lot of people have done this work, that the, the tonicity and probably the, the, the dextrose itself, uh, the pH, is all irritating. And so if you've had previous irritation, like surgery, then you hit it with uh, a, 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 a virgin peritoneal membrane with uh, an acid solution, the dialysate, and a hypertonic solution, the dialysate, that that is inflammatory provocative. Uh, icodextrin may have less of that. And that the reason I just mentioned those two things was the argument against flushing with uh, dialysate. Uh, because of the tonicity and the and the pH. My question, though, and the reason I raised my hand is to Rob and Matt, are you guys developing a, a, a questionnaire that goes beyond the original questionnaire from the original study where you, you drill down, Matt, on some of the details? For example, the severity of the adhesions, the location, things that we might be able to preoperatively to ask a surgeon to look at. Are you trying to develop a, a checklist of things that may enhance this study? Um, we are. We're looking at sort of registry 2.0. Right now, there's no registry data being entered because we finished our sample size, but we are interested in doing another grant and doing this kind of stuff where we kind of say, here's what we learned, here's the remaining questions, and we can do a better job next time. We'd also want a very, very detailed accounting of surgical uh, history if we can. Like we we did ask the question, but uh, we could do that in a more robust way, I think, as well. And then, uh, just to comment, I did put the link in the chat. I, I'd imagine as nephrologists, not many of us are following the journal Fertility and Sterility, but uh, might be hypothesis generating to some of us. 
Yeah, and, I, and maybe just raise the point too, just to what Tom said. You know, there are places. I, th I think it's, is it Fresenius units that don't flush. Um, so that that's like a common practice. Whereas other places are doing these weekly flushes. It'd be interesting to see if there was any data on you know whether the outcomes were different. Um, well, the, it, the, the outcomes have been looked at from buried catheters, which of course are not flushed, and that and those data are mixed. So, uh, yeah. but the the classic buried catheter would be the one. Uh, I sent to Anker uh, a a paper on uh, radiologic placement, and I don't know Anker whether you sent it out, but but I would because there are uh, where I am now in Vermont, they do ninety five percent by uh, uh, IR. I'm telling you, and we got to gather the. They haven't been keeping the the results, but I have the patients. I'm taking care of the patients, mm -hmm. and they're good. So one of the things as we go forward, that that's why I'm looking for uniformity uh, on the description of what the inside of the belly looks like, whether it's surgical or radiographic. The a description that's that's that the procedurist can can respond to. I mean, 20 questions are going to ignore. But if it's two or three key questions, uh, we can do that even with the what the interventional radiologists see as well as a surgeon. And I will share that uh, manuscript as well as the uh, echodextrin one after the talk. I thought I would let everyone kind of get stimulated in the conversation and then share. In the view of time, maybe we will move to the next manuscript and then uh, share our thoughts on that one. Okay, so the next paper that we'll talk about is titled Impact of Prior Abdominal Procedures on Peritoneal Dialysis Catheter Outcomes it is a retrospective cohort study among 11 institutions and it took place over a nine year period of time. The study population included adults who underwent their first catheter insertion. They included patients who had various surgical approaches to catheter insertion, including the lap laparoscopic approach, open surgical approach, and percutaneous methods as well. And similar to the previous study we just discussed, they were observed over a one-year time period as well. Excluded patients were those that had embedded catheters due to a delay, sometimes in their use, and those that were referred to another study out, outside of the study that had returned to their own institution were also excluded in case practices were differing between those institutions. After their inclusions and exclusions, about 860 total participants were included. 260 of them had prior abdominal surgeries and 600 of them did not have any prior history of those surgeries. The risk exposure was a prior abdominal procedure, which was defined as any procedure that had entered the peritoneum and was further subclassified into the location and the number of those procedures that had occurred. The aim or the primary outcomes was to determine the influence of prior abdominal procedures on the likelihood of experiencing either abandonment in the PD before the start interruption after initiation of start of PD, and then the termination of PD. The outcome was defined as a time between catheter insertion and these variables. And complications that may have resulted in abandonment, interruption, or termination included various scenarios, including infection in the tunnel exit site, or the, the tunnel, the exit site, peritonitis, also flow restriction, pain, bleeding, um, damage to the, the PD catheter and urinary retention as well. So many situations that we commonly see our patients undergo and that we treat frequently. The secondary outcomes included the rates of emergency room visits, hospitalizations, and then procedures that were related to the PD catheter itself. The number of abdominal procedures and their location was compared to the primary and the secondary outcomes explored in whether there was a dose-dependent relationship or not. The primary analysis outcome was summarized in cumulative incidence curves, very similar to the first paper we had also looked at together that accounted for the competing risks like death, transplant recovery of their kidney function. And then cause-specific proportional hazard models were used to determine this association between the exposure and the primary and the secondary outcomes. Very similar also to the first paper, baseline characteristics that were gathered included age, the gender of the patient, 
BMI, diabetes, the method of catheter insertion, and then some additional characteristics that were also included were whether they were on HD prior to the start of this time period, and then some intern intrinsic catheter characteristics were also accounted for in the model. This study also repeated the primary analysis separating infectious and non-infectious complications and solely for complications that were resulted to the method of PD catheter insertion as well. So we'll move on to um, some of the results. Table one um, shows the various baseline characteristics for both groups, the groups being prior abdominal procedures and no prior abdominal procedures. The most important variables that I found that were distinct for um, the group with the history of abdominal procedures were that they were slightly older, more likely to be female, and then had a higher BMI. So those are represented here with a p-value of less than 0 0.001. They also had a higher proportion of patients with a current or previous diagnosis of malignancy, peripheral vascular disease, abdominal hernias, and CAD. Probably the abdominal hernias is the most relevant to our discussion today. And then the rest of the table one, which I didn't include here, had the specific breakdowns of laparoscopic techniques, catheter characteristics, which overall were pretty varied between the two groups. So we'll move on to the main set of results. The two figures here are the crux of the results of the study. The left figure has the incidence of outcomes for the unadjusted risks, and the one on the right has um, for the adjusted risks. So figure two, the one on the left here, um, the y-axis shows the cumulative incidence of each of the primary outcome measures, and the x-axis has the time. So about 20% of all patients in this study experienced at least one PD catheter-related complication that led to either abandonment, interruption, or termination. 22% of those had some sort of prior abdominal surgery versus only 18% of those with no history of prior abdominal surgery. So even though it looks like these curves digest, uh, diverge in this first panel, in panel A, the, minimum, the difference between the two groups was actually quite minimal. And in panels B, C, and D, the curve, um, the curve between the two groups were also showing minimum, um, minimal differences. Probably the most difference was in this interrupted group, where um, most of the difference of cumulative incidence occurs within the first three months, and it's higher in the group that had the prior history of abdominal surgery. In fact, seventy percent of those incidences happen within the first three months. And then in figure three on the right here, this is a forest plot with the hazard ratios demonstrated on the x-axis um, is, is the, the, the ratios. And then on the y-axis are various variables of the baseline characteristics, like the history of abdominal surgery that was performed, and then also some specificities of the type of cuff um, being represented on the y-axis. But basically, the cumulative incidences of the primary endpoint at 12 months were about 18% for the individuals with no history of abdominal procedures and 22% in those that did have the history of abdominal procedures. So the data overall concludes that there's no significant difference between the two groups in the relative hazard ratios of the primary um, outcome for the adjusted model. The adjusted model confidence interval was between 0.68 and 1.84. Um, so the value does cross one there. For those variables here that um, do have a higher risk on the right side here, um, they should be you know, interpreted pretty cautiously. They also presented in the supplementary tables that there was no significant difference when the analysis was adjusted or repeated for infectious versus non-infectious outcomes or for the method of surgical in insertion of the catheter. And there are supplementary tables three and four also conclude that even when the number of prior abdominal surgeries increase, that there was no statistically significant increase in the risk compared to those that had no history of the abdominal surgeries. So table three here has the results of their secondary outcomes for association of ER visits, hospitalization, hospital days, and then subsequent catheter-related procedures. 
though the rates in N events does look higher, bear in mind that those um, also, also had the group with the higher number of patients and both the adjusted and the non-adjusted incident rate, rate ratios were non-significant for each of the um, confidence intervals that are shown on this part of the graph. And, you know, overall, they conclude that having undergone a prior abdominal procedure was not significantly associated with any risks of PD catheter related procedures, but also ER visits, hospital days and, and hospitalizations. So main takeaways from this paper, 20% uh, of patients experienced a catheter-related complication. Prior reports were about the same at 25%. Not having direct visualization of the abdomen to check for adhesions or adhesiolysis should not exclude patients from being at least considered for PD as a modality. They also failed to demonstrate a dose-dependent response between the number of prior procedures and the PD catheter-related complications. PD catheter complications in patients with upper abdominal procedures were higher, but these results um, should be interpreted with caution. A history of prior abdominal procedures likely should not influence candidacy for PD or whether the patients are referred for catheter insertion. And then lastly, I'll discuss some of the limitations of the paper. So this study used prior abdominal procedures as a surrogate for the presence of adhesions, but not all surgeries will result in clinically significant extent of adhesions. And since we included also surgical approaches where we may not get a direct visualization, we don't know the extent of those adhesions. So it's not fully generalizable to all patients because it selected those that were already suitable to have a PD catheter insertion. Majority of the centers participating in the registry would refer any patient who wishes to undergo PD for a catheter insertion except in rare circumstances where it was clearly futile. Um, there might be a, an indication bias because of that, which the authors do point out would be pretty small, difficult to quantify, and doesn't, uh, doesn't apply to all the centers as well in, in our practice locations. And then they also did not account for other unobserved co confounders. For example, a history of acute diverticulitis that may also contribute to inflammatory processes that occur intra-abdominally and could affect catheter outcomes. Thank you. I think uh, I would start with the biggest takeaway, which is, oh, sorry, you had one more. <laughs> oh, I just had one more slide. Um, these are, you know, big overarching conclusions that I think came from both papers. Um, so just to reiterate one more time, given that the incidence of the complications in this modality overall are fairly high, prior history of abdominal surgery, the number of surgeries and the modality of insertion and the location of prior procedures does not seem to affect the overall risk. Um, patients should be informed, like we've, we've already said um, this afternoon about the possible risks. And then various centers across our practice location should be cautious, cautious from at least discouraging patients um, at, for PD as a mo modality for treatment, especially if they've had a, um, a history of prior abdominal surgery. Thank you. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm glad I gave you an opportunity to go because I had very similar thoughts to how you concluded here. And I think this was a really important study because we really do use prior abdominal surgeries as our clinical surrogate for abdominal adhesions. And we use that as a surrogate for potential catheter-related uh, outcomes. And I think that we saw in the first half of this that that second surrogate is accurate. The more adhesions you have, the more likely you are to have complications. But we didn't see the full picture. We didn't see that prior abdominal surgeries are associated with catheter-related complications, nor that prior abdominal surgeries are associated with adhesions. And as you said, there are other things that cause adhesions. And so I think this was a really important study to make us second guess our approach. Uh, Osama, you've got your hand raised, and then I would love to hear Rob and Matt's thoughts. Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, looking at the HKD paper, so the, the surgery one that we're talking about, right? I was interested in looking at the types of procedures that were done. So that, that was table two, uh, in the paper. And I know that when the analysis was done, it looks like it was kind of grouped like prior surgery versus no prior surgery. Uh, but I wonder, was there any differences in the outcomes if you like parsed through whether there were like lower abdominal pelvic procedures versus upper abdominal procedures? Was there any difference there? I mean, it looks like the most common procedures of patients 
that were included in the study were like a cholecystectomy, hysterectomy, C-section, right? Which which tend to, to be, statistically speaking, right, the most common procedures our patients have. If we take those patients versus like, let's say everybody else or like a region versus the rest, um, do you know if there was any differences there? Yeah, so I can speak to that, Osama. I think, um, you know, we did divide it out into upper and lower and pelvic. Um, so lower and pelvic were grouped together. We use the level of the umbilicus as the kind of cut point, um, which, you know, has some problems just because it's sometimes difficult to, to parse them into those categories cleanly. Um, interestingly, you know, we found that the upper abdominal procedures conferred a higher risk. And we were a bit surprised by that finding. Um, and there was a couple of theories put forward for that. You know, John Crabtree was involved in this. When I asked him that question, he said, well, you know, one of the things that when we're doing lower abdominal or pelvic procedures, we're quite vigilant to make sure that we're getting rid of the bloody seepage and all of that stuff and cleaning out the pelvis um, really thoroughly when they're doing the procedures. Whereas in the upper ones, you may not visualize the pelvis as well. And there's the possibility those things get into the pelvis, they're not cleaned out, and they may lead to it adhesions. It's purely speculative. It was honestly like unforeseen. We didn't expect to see that finding. And it is secondary analysis. So I think we'd probably just take it with a grain of salt. But if anything, there was a signal that the upper procedures were worse. I would just also add, um, having gone through these procedures with a fine tooth comb, um, I'm not even sure that's the right way to look at them, right? There's like, there's sort of like your garden variety elective procedures, you know, your elective cholecystectomy um, versus, you know, an appendectomy with appendicitis, you know, that's different. And then there's like big surgeries, like colon surgeries, gastric surgeries, liver surgeries, um, and then the whole OB-GYN surgeries. It's really interesting. And I think in the future, what we need to do is just do a careful accounting of the actual surgery um, and what it was for and whether there was infection. And then you can create sort of a matrix and look at that. Because one of the things that comes out here is this whole percutaneous versus laparoscopic approach. So somebody has surgery X or Y in the clinic and you're deciding which way to go, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, if the person's had a cholecystectomy can it, or a appendectomy, can they have a percutaneous approach uh, as, as well as they can have a, as, or as a laparoscopic approach better? That's a big unknown question too um, that I wonder about is because one could argue based on the adhesial lysis analysis, which we didn't comment on, but, but when we did analyze the role of adhesial lysis, it at most in our analysis reduced the risk by 15, 10 to 15%. It was not statistically significant, but it was, was it was a reduced effect size. So it could be that even if adhesions are present from surgery and you do a percutaneous approach, it just doesn't matter. And, and even if you've gone in and done adhesial lysis, it doesn't even help with that much. And some people might say it makes it worse because you're causing more trauma. So there's a lot of like unknowns here that I think are very fascinating to explore. Yeah, Matt touched on the, the kind of emergent versus elective surgery, which is the other kind of grouping that we didn't get into. But you can imagine that somebody that comes in with an acute abdomen, you know, has a ruptured appendix is different than an elective, you know, um, pelvic procedure. Um, the other thing I point out is there, there's clearly a difference between women and men. And, you know, women definitely had a lot more lower abdominal and pelvic surgeries just by the nature of their anatomy. And I, I often wondered if their anatomy by itself, you know, predisposes them to catheter dysfunction. You have a uterus, whereas the, the men don't. And, you know, it may be that, that that extra room in the pelvis makes a difference. So there's a lot of interesting things, I think, that came out of this project, some of which we didn't even see coming. And it'd be interesting to explore some of this stuff further. Susie, your thoughts? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on the whole adhesial lysis um, uh, thing. You know, in the end, if the if you're doing a laparoscopic surgery and you're doing adhesial lysis, you're looking into the abdomen. And I know our surgeons would not intentionally place a catheter into an area that has adhesion. So I think the other point to make is that when you're doing that, you're obviously looking for a spot that works better. And I've had patients who had... Um, adhesions and have gone back to surgery multiple times and then had successful um, catheter placement and was able to proceed with the uh, uh, PD, so. Definitely. Uh, and then 
I guess from a statistical perspective, there were a lot of hypotheses tested here, and I should probably know the answer to this. Was there an adjustment for multiple comparisons uh, with all the significance testing done? No. So, I mean, I, I think, and we tried to be clear about this in the paper, but the primary outcome, you know, we specified a priori, we adjusted that, and that that's really the only one you should pay close attention to. Mm -hmm. We did pre-specify the secondary analyses, but, you know, the intent was never to kind of hang your hat on them. So we didn't do any, any um, you know, p-value adjustment based on the number of comparisons that we did. Makes sense. And uh, potentially, as you mentioned, future works. Uh, other thoughts from the audience? Uh, Tom, you've got thoughts. It goes to my uh, earlier question about uh, the, the the material that you're data gathering. I had had an email with Matt just a few days ago about uh, uh, bringing in new uh, un units for, for the future. And as Matt said in a comment just a few minutes ago, uh, they're looking for funding to do that. But in the meantime, Matt and... and uh, uh, Rob, if you could share, to, at least to those of us that are interested, the types of data that you're wanting to gather and, and let us look at that checklist of the types of questions, keeping them very simple. And the, the context of it is that the radiologists where I am now in Vermont are very skilled at doing this. I'm, I mean, I'm impressed, very impressed with what they're able to do. And maybe there there's some insight into what they do that helps us gather more data in the decision-making tree to what Susie said about how do you anticipate before you go in uh, what's going on? So anyway, if you would, as you, what are the types of questions, simple, straightforward, that surgeons or interventionalists might be able to start thinking about uh, as we go forward with data gathering? Because as Matt pointed out to me, Privately, you are, we, we're going to go forward with this. We're going to uh, get more money and and do more studies. So we need to to unify what was the word make uniform the questions that we're asking. Yeah, I'll let Matt chime in. But I I mean from my perspective, I think it's not not really up to us. I think we as a community, based on the results of this, need to figure out where do we go next. Where are our priorities? Where do we think the important areas to to explore are? Because I mean, this 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 grant alone was, you know, almost one and a half million dollars. It took ten years to kind of get from conception to to finishing the cohort. Um, so I think we have to be really strategic, pick things that are relevant to people, and you know, I think we need your input. Uh, is is where I'd see it. I I think we really need as a community to decide where to go next because it takes time and a lot of money. But I don't know what you think, Matt. Um, yeah, I definitely agree. Um, part of the grant, there's a third phase that's funded, uh, and we do have money left to sort of create, create group consensus. Originally, we'd propose it to be best practices, but we're kind of moving away from that and more talking about variation in practice, key questions going forward where we can enhance um, information. The other thing I just I wanted to point out is that in the paper on adhesions, there, we also reported the number of adhesions that had formed uh, during uh, that were seen at revision that were not present. Uh, on initial insertion, and it was a significant number. So it goes back to this icodextrin thing. It would be very interesting to to look at an icodextrin flush post PD catheter insertion to see if it prevents adhesions, and then stratify that for people who had adhesions at baseline, because maybe there are some people that are just adhesion formers, and other people don't form adhesions. So there's lots of interesting stuff there. And maybe too, Matt, just make a plug. You know, we are we've been talking to John Crabtree about um, hosting some webinars where we try to highlight some of the key findings from the PD catheter registry, engage the surgical community and the operators, um, as well as the broader PD community, and, and have a bit of a, you know, a look at what did the prior literature show? What did we find? You know, what do we see as kind of the important knowns and unknowns? What's the future directions with this work? Let's try to get more broader input and, uh, you know, from people across disciplines, to get a sense of where this should go. So, you know, you'll be hearing more about that, but um, I think these webinars will be a great way to educate people about the findings of the study, but also uh, get some ideas about future directions. Yeah, to Tom's pot, well, what I wanted to say about the best practices is that it's not really about best practices, it's about what is your practice and what outcomes are you getting with it? And so, you know, Tom is talking about a scenario there where you might be getting excellent results with radiology, 
but another radiology department may not get those results or someone may get excellent results with a midline approach, but others don't. And, you know, that kind of thing, I think we have to sort of look at, you know, what are the objective results coming from different variations in practice? What are the options available to people? And kind of go from there. That's why we're moving away from sort of this best practices approach. Yeah, and we're hoping we'll highlight, you know, operators that do a great job with a given modality or a given method of insertion and see what we can learn from them, what's different about them and their practice that might influence outcomes that we could translate to others. Um, and then, you know, I'll just remind you too, the primary outcomes uh, of this grant, we're really looking at method of insertion and uh, the other one was operator volume and its impact on outcomes. So that's still to be reported. We've now closed the data set and it should be coming soon. So we'd be really keen to kind of see those results. And we're hoping to do some more apple to apple comparisons around method of insertion to see if you take a similar sort of patient, you know, does percutaneous versus surgical placement really make that big a difference? Or are there subsets of patients that should be referred for one modality versus the other? So a lot, lot still outstanding. Well, I think that forward-looking statement and uh, exciting preview of literature to look out from from the catheter registry would be a great way to close this out unless anyone has any other questions or comments. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you for a phenomenal presentation, Shraddha. Thank you for joining Matt and Rob and to everyone in the audience. Uh, this is very much a collaborative effort between myself and Osama El Shami, who uh, actually started these journal clubs. So we appreciate your coming and we will be back uh, next month on October 21st and everyone is welcome. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.